Hey there, welcome back to our series on close reading. Um, just a reminder, close reading is rereading a text to sort of figure out how the text works. And uh, today we're going to talk about interrupted reading, which is one of my favorite strategies for uh, both literary or informational text. Uh, and I'll talk about how it works right after the theme song. So this is episode three of this series on close reading strategies. And considering that episode two was about cake and pie, you might be thinking, oh, well, I bet this interrupted reading thing is really simple as well and really basic. And in a way, yes, it's easy because there are only three steps to it, but also it's really effective and really complex. Um, this is a technique that I actually teach to my advanced placement students when they get a passage that they have never seen before and they're asked to analyze it, I say, do an interrupted reading, follow these steps. Uh, and we practice it a lot and I create interrupted readings for them so that they can kind of see what it really looks like and uh, why it is effective for them. So this is not a basic or simple strategy in that way. But there are three steps, I said. Um, and step number one, I talked about way back in the first episode where you, you give a quick reading to get the gist. Um, the close reading part is in the rereading and there are a couple of steps that you do during the rereading. Step number two is where you kind of look for natural breaks in the text so that you can create for yourself uh, three or four, or depending on the length, five or six chunks of text. Uh, and the reason why you do that is that it's a lot easier to analyze a couple, three paragraphs at a time than it is to analyze an entire uh, thousand word or 1200 word or 40,000 word novel. Um, so uh, breaking it into chunks. And then step three is you ask some questions about those chunks. Uh, you can ask both what questions, which are kind of the surface questions, but more importantly, you would ask why questions or how questions. Uh, and those are the ones that are like the go below questions, if you remember my six constants, or uh, the uh, go although, so like why didn't the author do this other thing? Um, so uh, that's where the real magic comes in, is in step three. Now, I said this technique would be effective with both literary and informational text. Uh, but for our example today, we are only going to use an informational text. This would be a much longer video if I tried to do one literary and one informational. But the technique is exactly the same whether you're doing an informational or literary text. Uh, the text for today is uh, an essay from the mid 80s, I think 1986, called uh, Black Men in Public Spaces by a guy named Brent Staples. Uh, I, uh, it's going to be the first link down below in the video description. So uh, I want you to hit your pause button, go down and click on that link, read it, and then come back. Okay, so uh, that was step one. You gave it a quick read to get the gist. Uh, and now for step two, we'd go back and break it into chunks. So what I'm actually going to say is pause the video again. And, uh, you know, I know you can't actually take a pen and write on your screen where the chunks are, but make some notes for yourself about where you think you would break this text into chunks. Uh, and then we'll come back and talk about that. All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, for my money, I think Staples' uh, text here can be broken into four reasonably natural chunks. Now, maybe you got three, maybe you got five, maybe you got eight, I don't know. Um, the point is not that you and I are going to exactly match or that the chunks that you make would be exactly the same chunks as your teacher. That is not the point. The point is that you feel like this chunk here is a naturally self-contained chunk that I, I can work with. Uh, and then this chunk here is another naturally self-contained chunk that I can work with. That's what's important. But um, if it were me, these would be my chunks. Uh, the first couple of paragraphs would be chunk number one. He starts with this book uh, that immediately gets you interested. And uh, he's got somewhat of a thesis sitting there 
in paragraph number two. Um, then I would say that chunk two is paragraphs three, four, and five, because that's where he talks about the moments when he becomes aware of this unwieldy inheritance, to quote from his thesis. Um, it, it's really sort of the, the nascent, or the beginning of his awareness. Uh, then I uh, would take uh, actually a long chunk in terms of paragraphs, paragraph six through ten, would I think would constitute uh, a third chunk. You might think that there are two chunks within those uh, five paragraphs, and that's okay. Uh, but I think you know his childhood and growing up, and his early life as a Chicago reporter, and uh, that really terrible, harrowing experience of one of his colleagues in Waukegan, Illinois. Um, I feel like those are all uh, of a piece. They all kind of go together into one chunk, and then the, the last two paragraphs, uh, 11 and 12. Um, really make up a conclusion because uh, we kind of this is what he has learned and this is how he has changed his behavior. Uh, step three in this process of interrupted reading is asking some questions and as I said uh, near the beginning I like to ask two kinds of questions when I'm uh, doing this with students. Uh, some basic what questions and the why questions or the how questions where you really start to dig into uh, the way the text is constructed and the choices that the author, in this case Brent Staples, has made. Um, and the what questions should be pretty easy, uh, pretty basic, and uh, ought, the answers also ought to be pretty easy or pretty basic. For example, if you know that you've got this text broken into an introduction and a conclusion and a couple, three, four chunks in between, you know that the what question for the introduction might be, uh, what's Staples' hook? what's his thesis? Your question for the conclusion might be, does he have a call to action or, you know, what has changed? Uh, your chunks uh, in the middle, the what question is, uh, what is he providing as evidence? Where it gets interesting is when you start asking the how questions or the why questions. So looking at chunk one for me as a how question, uh, it's not going to be what's his thesis. Uh, I would ask a how question here about his diction. And if you're not sure what diction is, I'm going to put a link below to uh, uh, an entire playlist I have uh, on diction. Um, but basically, diction just means choice of words. So what kind of words is he using? And uh, I'm going to apologize because I will stare at my notes instead of looking into the camera while I read some of these words that stood out to me. Um, tyranny, ugly, seeped, hazard, dicey, accomplice, and that phrase, vast, unnerving gulf. Those are words that Staples chose on purpose because they carry certain weight. Uh, if you describe uh, something as being uh, tyranny uh, or uh, ugly, the audience is going to have a reaction to that. So why did Staples choose that diction? Or how does the diction in this first chunk help us understand his thesis even more. That, I think, is a really excellent how or why question to ask for chunk number one. But you could also uh, ask about the imagery. Now, this is not a literary text, and so you are not necessarily expecting a lot of flowery language or a lot of metaphors or similes. But uh, take a look at this phrase. A broad six feet two inches with a beard and billowing hair, both hands shoved into the pockets of a bulky military jacket. I mean, that creates a certain picture, doesn't it? Or this one, a softy, barely able to take a knife to raw chicken, right? And so that imagery there creates a very stark contrast between what a white woman sees when she sees Brent Staples and how Brent Staples sees himself. Uh, so a, a powerful how question is how does the imagery help us see Brent Staples' uh, thesis or main idea in this first chunk. In uh, chunk number two, the, the how question or the why question that I would ask uh, would probably start with how is Staples using the rhetorical appeals, appeals to ethos, appeals to uh, pathos, and appeals to logos. Now, if you've never heard those before, I will also put a link down below in the description uh, to a series I did on rhetoric that covers uh, all of those appeals, ethos, pathos, and logos appeals. Uh, but I would be looking for things like, um, does his choice of words and does his use of evidence, including a lot of personal experience, 
establish some credibility between him and you in the audience. Does the, uh, the kind of evidence that he present, does it make a uh, logical case for what it is that he is saying? Uh, so I think those are going to be the how questions for chunk number two. In uh, what I think of as chunk number three, but you might have split it into two different chunks. Again, uh, we're getting Staples' uh, childhood memories, but then also his own experience as a young reporter and uh, that experience of a colleague in the suburbs with the police. Uh, so again, I would be thinking about those appeals. How is he establishing credibility? Uh, does his evidence provide a logical backing? But here I think is really where an appeal to pathos comes in. An appeal to pathos is manipulating the emotions of the reader. And uh, when he talks about his memories and the harrowing experience of that other reporter, um, that brings forward some emotion in the reader. And you can tell that these were emotional experiences for Staples. Um, so the, the how question, in this section would be how does Staples really serve uh, or work to manipulate your emotions, the audience's emotions, in order to make his point more effectively. And uh, finally, chunk four is his conclusion. Um, and so one of the, the things that I always teach students to look for in a conclusion is how the statement of a main idea, if it's stated in the conclusion, and usually is, how is that statement of a main idea in the conclusion similar to or different from the statement of the main idea near the beginning of the essay? So take a look actually at, uh, this is the first sentence of paragraph 11. I learned to smother the rage I felt at so often being taken for a criminal. Now, this is a powerful statement and it does in fact call back to his main idea as it was stated back in paragraph two when, when he talks about the quote, unwieldy inheritance. But what he does here is by restating it in completely different words, much more uh, emotional words, much heavier words, um, he takes that unwieldy inheritance, which is kind of, uh, you know, a little bit of a nice way of saying what he's saying and he says, this unwieldy inheritance really means that I am always being mistaken for a criminal. And that is a very different statement, a very powerful statement that uh, would have been out of place at the beginning of the essay because at the beginning of the essay, he hasn't yet really established enough evidence or enough credibility to lay something like that on us. In this conclusion, you can also talk about um, why is it that he is the one who feels like he has to change? Why is it that he is uh, uh, now whistling Vivaldi when he walks down the street? Vivaldi, uh, composer, link below, etc. cetera. Um, why that? And uh, why, why isn't society changing? And that actually leads to another really good question that I would ask if I were assigning this essay. How would this essay from 1986 be different if he wrote it today? 30 years later in America, would he still have to do this? Would he still have to whistle Vivaldi? Are his experiences walking down the street in uh, New York where he lives or Chicago where you know some of this stuff originally happened, are those experiences going to be the same in you know, 2016, 2018? as they were in 1986. Um, or a, another really excellent way uh, to think about it is, how does this essay from 30 years ago compare to the way some people are writing today? People like ta Coates or Michelle Williams or others who are writing about um, you know, black-white interaction and uh, maybe the, the Black Lives Matter movement and that sort of thing. Uh, because I think there's a really good place uh, or a, a really good uh, thread of evidence that you can follow where you could make the case in your analysis that this essay is as much a product of its time, of the rhetorical context of 1986, as it is a statement on uh, racial relations in this country. And that you could say that things might be different today. Or you can say, holy cow, 
uh, I was just reading Between the World and Me by ta Coates and things have not changed. I was just watching the news and things have not changed. Uh, that I think would be a really important thing to bring to any analysis of this particular text. And that is it. Uh, that's interrupted reading in a nutshell. Obviously, uh, because it is a, a good and complex tool, there's a lot more to it that we could talk about and, you know, how would you use it in a literary text, that sort of thing. Um, but practice it, right? When you're given a text, whether your teacher is explicitly telling you to do an interrupted reading or not, uh, you do that. Read it once for the gist. Step one, read it uh, again and uh, mark some natural occurring breaks where you can break the text into chunks, that's step two, and then go through and ask questions. The surface what questions, but also those uh, go below questions, what's below the surface, and the go although questions, the uh, what if he had written it today kind of questions, because that is what's going to make a pretty powerful analysis when you write your response to the text. Anyway, I'll see you for the next one. <music>